So I want to thank all of you for coming. Some of you have come from very far, so Washington State and uh, New Jersey and Michigan and all over. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to provide an update, but also a really big overview of the projects we're, we're involved with, particularly dealing with the technology in uh, free energy sector, because there's a lot of misunderstandings in the public on that. And that has been something that we've worked on now for intensely for 15 years. Uh, this will be shared with the public via YouTube and the internet. And the reason for it is that there's a big learning curve to understanding the technology, but more importantly, to understanding the policy issues, the national security issues, um, the details of how you evaluate these technologies, and moving through the minefield of claims that are out there on the internet in particular, which has become a huge problem in the last year for us. So I, I want to first give you sort of the big picture. And the big picture is that we haven't needed fossil fuels since about 100 years ago. This building was built in 1913. Certainly by then, uh, Tesla, Faraday, Maxwell, particularly the maxwell quaternion equations that were chopped off and changed, as you may well know, some of you who are engineers, uh, has resulted in us having a energy sector that requires us to burn something or heat something up to create steam to get us electricity or to run our cars. Uh, however, a hundred years of really advanced physics, which weren't that well understood a hundred years ago in terms of very high voltage systems at certain resonant high hertz, they call it, cycles per second. Uh, we'll get into this later, would result in this excess power. And it was observed by Faraday, and it was observed by Tesla, and it was observed by many others, and said, where is this coming from? Uh, Professor Dirac, D-I-R-A-C, said, well, he called it the Dirac Sea. And, of course, Tesla called it the, the, the Sea of the Ocean of Infinite Energy. And it's been called various things. The modern term is the zero-point energy field. Uh, and as many of you may know, one of the writers for Jane's Defense Weekly, uh, uh, Mr. Cook, wrote an article about this, Jane's Defense Weekly being a very big uh, defense journal out of Great Britain, very prestigious journal, uh, and then wrote a book uh, called The Hunt for Zero Point, uh, which I recommend, um, based on a lot of information that we had begun to put out, and particularly as it applies to propulsion. All right, so if you create this kind of vector into the zero-point energy field and you create a certain uh, counter-rotating vortex, let's call it, which is, is almost a, a Sufi-like phenomenon, you get what's called lift, and you get an, a phenomenon uh, that's known as uh, electromagnetogravitics. Now, the pop culture would call it anti-gravity, which is really not correct. What you're really doing when you see a UFO moving and it's going straight up 10,000 miles per hour against gravity is that it's actually in a space-time bubble. It's creating its own environment, shall we say. So there's no restrictions to normal aerodynamic formula. And so the thing can lift and go straight up at those velocities and if it goes through a certain, another level, that the entire object, the mass of the entire object, can become massless. And this has to do with things that are very technical, that we'll get into a little bit later if you're interested in the technical part of this, which I think is fascinating. And that's when you enter into what's called the trans-dimensional physics, when something moves from one dimension to another, or transverses one dimension to another. By definition, all interstellar vehicles are transdimensional. Let me repeat that. If it's interstellar, it is transdimensional. It is not getting here at a subluminal or below the speed of light velocity. This is a key understanding because most people will say, well, maybe they're interdimensional or maybe they're interstellar. And I'm going, 
hmm, you don't understand the physics of this. If it's interstellar and it's here, meaning it somehow went from another star system to here, and someone's lifespan, <laughs> a creature's lifespan, even if you live to be 800 years old, um, it's got to be faster than the speed of light. But, it's, but the term faster than the speed of light is a misnomer because you're no longer bound by the physics of the speed of light or the, even the normal vacuum of space that we think of because you've resonantly shifted into these, if you will, parallel universes or enfolded universes transdimensionally, and then you step back down into this one. Too much information? No. All right. So this is, this is the key thing that people have to understand uh, and began to be studied. Now, in the early days, let's go back to the time of uh, you know, Tesla. They were observing with usually DC power systems, direct current, as opposed to alternating current, which we use in our homes, which Nikola Tesla invented or came up with, that would have this effect where a certain amount of energy would go into a system, more would come out. It wasn't it really accepted until uh, Dr. Casimir, a physicist named Casimir, and the Casimir effect, where this was published in mainstream physics journals, by the way, proved that there was this zero-point energy field, that there was this energy that was left even after you cooled down all the atoms and all the activity in the universe down to absolute zero, which is a specific temperature. And there's still this energy there. And that zero-point energy field, as it turns out, is embedded everywhere in space, not outer space, here in this room. So that every cubic centimeter of space in this room, for example, uh, has enough power to run at least the United States for a day, a cubic centimeter. So it's an enormous field of energy. So running our planet on this energy field would be like taking a thimble out of the Great Lakes or something of water. It, it, it's a trivia, it's a, it's a rounding error. Uh, however, as J.P. Morgan famously was reported to have said to Nikola Tesla, when he had a car that had a little antenna on it that was running around where the batteries were charging it themselves. J.P. Morgan said, if we can't put a meter on it, we don't want it. Big bankers. Now, 100 years ago or 90 years ago to today, nothing's really changed in terms of the geopolitical, financial, macroeconomic exigencies. And that's the huge problem. Is there a technical challenge? Yes. And we'll get into how we can, we, we can mount a, a sort of effort together to come up with a, a modern day version of, of what Tesla had. But the geopolitical macroeconomic policy issue is the big problem. And it isn't just because there are a few bankers and kleptocrats that are misanthropic sociopaths, although some of them are. Um, it's because there are a lot of stakeholders who don't want to have to deal with the change. I remember my military advisor once meeting with an admiral who was in charge of CONUS, Continental United States Security, saying, well, this is all wonderful and I know that those technologies do exist in classified programs. It's too big of a change for me to have to deal with. I just want to see that everything is, stays in sort of a homeostasis, we don't rock the boat too much, and I retire from this command and get to go fishing at my place in Montana. No, really, all right? So having had dozens and dozens of meetings personally with people like that in the national security structure in Washington, in the United Kingdom, from France and elsewhere, there is this consistent refrain of, this is a great thing, but it's too big of a change. It's too big of a, uh, a challenge. And therefore, therefore, if it's that big of a challenge, it's better just to kick the can down the road and let someone else deal with it later. So there's been 100 years of kicking the can down the road. Meanwhile, to give you a very big picture of how much trouble we have at this point, we have a geopolitical order where our national, vital national security interests, which is a mantra here in Washington, is a actual phrase for oil, protecting the oil interest. The madness going on in the Ukraine and Crimea right now is 100% or largely influenced by natural gas and oil politics. Certainly the Middle East, anyone knows that that is. 
Um, people say, well, there's Israel there. I say, yes, but they have a couple hundred thermonuclear weapons and can take care of them. <laughs> I know for a fact they do. So the big problem becomes if you have, let's say in 1920, seven or so, 1927, there were two billion people in the world. Now there's seven. So of those two billion people, there were very few people living with cars and electricity in their homes and et cetera and so on. Now you have seven billion people and billions more people living on that system, which has become entrenched, bureaucratically built into our funding mechanisms from the state, local, federal level of support and also where there are a lot of very powerful stakeholders. And so from a rational point of view, you'd say, well, these technologies would get us off of oil, gas, nuclear power, no more Fukushima's. But from the point of view of people who are looking at the national security equation from a macroeconomic stability point of view, this is their worst nightmare. Up the road here, between here and the White House, if you walk straight up the road here, you'll end up at the White House. It's at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and we're on 16th Street. Um, I was at the university club with a man who was sort of the consigliere for President Bush Jr., W., uh, a few years ago. Um, and we were having dinner, and this is a place, you know, you'd have Rumsfeld there and other people there, you know, uh, in this place having, having dinner or lunch. It's a private club, I don't belong to it, but I was invited. Actually, I had to put on a jacket. I was shocked and appalled. Anyway, so I did. And he, you know, he said, look, you have to understand that everyone who gets into that house, pointing to the White House, becomes, governs as a conservative from the point of view of the classic definition, don't change anything, conserve, don't change. State, keep things as they are tradition. Because when you're dealing with a change this large, this is what the people call a disruptive technology, but writ large. And disruptive technology writ large in this, how I'm speaking of it, is something that would have a multi-hundred trillion dollar impact. Not billion, trillion. So I'm, let me repeat that, multi-hundred trillion dollar impact. Because once this is disclosed, and this backs into why, quote, UFOs are secret and forbidden to talk about in polite circles, is that a UFO is really just an, a misnomer for an alternative energy and propulsion device. All right? They are not moving using Exxon Jet A fuel. All right? They're not using a nuclear reactor on those little things. They're using this whole new area of physics, which is elegant, beautiful, life-sustaining for the planet. But if you said those were real, people would say, oh, how are they moving like that? Any physicist at MIT would ask this question if they thought it was real and had been brainwashed by the psychological warfare disinformation campaign launched by the CIA in 1953. So that's the problem, is that if you begin to talk about the phenomena of new energy, free energy, anti-gravity, UFOs, you're stepping into an area that is the most sensitive, compartmented intelligence in the history of the United States. Mm -hmm.